All right, guys, I'm going to get right into it. Uh, my talk. Uh, this is part retrospective. It's, it's also uh, mostly for context, because uh, I know a lot of you probably haven't been to a DevOps days before. Uh, you're probably new to DevOps, and uh, maybe you've got questions. Maybe it's all really weird to you. Uh, so this is for you guys. Um, and uh, I want to leave you with a little bit of advice to go back to your organization with, and, and hopefully do some good and, and make things a little bit easier for you. Um, so I, the alternate title is some of you work in startups and you have no idea what the hell is going on here. Um, because as we know, you know, startups are a different beast. They respond to the same problems and, and deal with the same situations, but at much, much smaller scale. And you might not realize that you have giant empathy problems in a startup because you all sit around the same table and eat lunch together. So, um, but bear with me, if you're, even if you're part of a startup, there's some valuable stuff in here and there's lots of context. So uh, maybe you're here to find out you know, what all the fuss is about. Um, Betsy mentioned the hype cycle. We're, like, we're definitely in there. We're well in there at this point. Um, maybe you want to hear success and failure stories, learn from other people's experience, uh, hear about toys and techniques and different ways of approaching uh, transformation or projects or something you're working on. And uh, maybe you're just here to escape work, right? But uh, the joke's probably on you because uh, you're probably on call right now. So uh, enjoy that. Uh, and if you run out of the room, we all know what that's about. So uh, don't feel bad. Um, but really, I think the real reason why we're here is, is to, to learn and share from each other. And I think that's really valuable. And uh, something like Open Spaces is priceless for that. So definitely take advantage. Um, propose your own topics and get involved that way. Uh, and you'll, s you'll find that when you leave and you go back, it's the open spaces that really stuck with you and gave you the actionable items and the things that you're going to do right away. Um, so those of us who, who come to these things over and over again, and there's, there's a couple old faces here, um, we're happy to have you. We're really glad that you're here. And, and we're really glad to see this happening in Detroit. So, uh, so welcome. And uh, thanks for coming out. So a little bit about me starting out. Um, I've, I've got about 18 years in IT from like fixing computers at the very, very beginning. Um, and I work for big companies and startups and back and forth. Uh, right now, I, I work for a tiny startup. Uh, and, uh, and I love throwing Frisbees. Uh, that's, that's a little non-work thing that I spend a lot of time on. Um, so when we talk about uh, DevOps, uh, there's a lot of nebulous information there and, and people try to decide if it's a trend or if it's uh, something that's been a long time coming and I would argue that uh, you know really it's it's a bit of both right it's it's partially a, a name that we've assigned to a trend but really it's been coming forever right and my talk is about where it's come from and the things that went into uh, making it what it is and and having it be this giant uh, force in our industry right now. So really, this is kind of chronological, but I'm not going to assign dates to anything. There's not going to be any uh, real super technical history parts. I'm not going to put numbers on anything, but it's all in order, uh, and it brings us through sort of the, the path of, uh, of DevOps. So um, I started in tech support. Um, I was answering calls at IBM, fixing Active Directory problems, probably like a couple of you. Um, then I went through build and release engineering, then IT management, then back into build and release engineering, then into systems engineering, and then consulting. And, and now I'm a CTO sort of doing all kinds of, of crap. Basically, all of that stuff in one, in one role in a tiny company. Uh, I've always been a generalist, so for me, DevOps means a lot because it's sort of this culmination that validates my entire career, right? It's like all this op stuff that I used to do and all this dev stuff I used to do and it was all kind of mashed together and now we have like this area that's kind of dedicated to it and I like it a lot, but it's still really confusing because it means different things to different people. Um, that's what it means to me. It means something different to you. That's totally fine. Uh, but I think build and release engineering is kind of this unique place where where it sort of 
blossomed because of its position between dev and ops and always having to be, you know, kind of the human wall between uh, dev and ops the whole ways. So I, I've got a view into this my whole career uh, pretty much and, and I think it's been valuable. So, so my argument is that DevOps is not a revolution. It didn't come from nowhere, right? Um, and it's, it's come from this sort of, uh, this battle against technical debt that we've faced throughout the history of building software. Um, and there are, uh, just, a <laughs> just a stupid comment about this slide. There are tons of images about uh, kids and computers online, but this is my favorite. It's definitely the, the absolute worst one that I could find. Uh, so you're welcome. Um, and uh, and I, when I talk about technical debt, um, I, a term I like to think about, uh, which nobody talks about and I can't really talk about, but I wanted to throw it in here because I love it. Um, Zugzwang is like a, it's like a chess term, right, where you're sort of forced into making a move that's going to hurt you. But you have to, you have to make a move, you have to do something, but it's going to be painful and it could actually cause you to lose the game. Uh, but because of the structure of chess and the obligation to make a move every, every turn, uh, sometimes you're put into these crappy situations where you have to make a decision that's ultimately going to be bad and you try and choose the least bad. Uh, and I think that speaks to me about technical debt a great deal because people don't choose to do uh, stupid things. You know, they, they do choose to do the thing that they think is the best choice, uh, whether or not it's uh, painful or whether or not it's, it's going to hurt them in the long run. They have to choose uh, given the information they have at the time and often it's forced and, and there's an obligation there, right? We have to move fast, we're in businesses, we can't just take that for granted, especially you know, uh, nowadays and more and more in the future, right? Everything moves faster, it doesn't move slower. So uh, with this frame in mind, uh, what I wanna say is, is that technical debt is kind of the, uh, the overarching theme uh, of my talk that that frames the situation for the, the arisal of DevOps. And uh, when we think of the, the, the early days, um, a lot of us like talking about manufacturing when we talk about things like continuous delivery and delivery pipelines and shipping code and uh, delivering value and all this stuff. It's all very sequential and runs through uh, pipelines and channels, right? Um, and that was all about consistency at scale. So the original assembly line was about scaling up our consistency and being able to do things faster because we could automate things, right, to a certain degree. And uh, technical debt relates to that pretty closely because you've got waste, you know, you've got poor processes. Uh, you could be building the wrong thing and all of this happened way back in the day with manufacturing as well and still happens with manufacturing. Uh, but with, with software what you get is you sort of get your consistency for free and you get your scale for free to a large extent, right? Um, you can build one thing and, and replicate it indefinitely and pretty much guarantee that it's exactly the same when you replicate it. Um, and from there, you know, we started doing these uh, software projects and, and started building things sequentially, right? Based on this manufacturing theory of, you know, you sort of build a pipeline to build things and then you put in inputs and you get out outputs and uh, this is very business driven, right? It's, it's very like high level theory focused. And uh, it turns out it's a giant misunderstanding, right? Like waterfall was never supposed to be the way it is. Um, but there's a lot of parallels to DevOps in that way, right? Like DevOps is sort of understood by different people in different ways. Uh, there's a lot of methodologies and schools of thought. And even with Waterfall, there's different tools, right? Everyone has different tools and techniques, and there was all kinds of stuff, people selling you things for Waterfall, right? Based on this assumption that it was popular at a time and everybody was doing it, right? So it's kind of this ancient parallel to, uh, to DevOps. And we all miss uh, Waterfall eventually when we move on and, uh, from these organizations that are super siloed and, and running really old school software delivery uh, techniques and uh, we get better jobs at more agile organizations and everybody here is hiring so it's you know it's not really a problem so if, if you're stuck in a waterfall organization um, 
I would advise moving to another company. Don't try and fix that problem. It's, uh, it's probably not solvable by you, but uh, you know, if you want to tackle it, you're a champion, and uh, maybe we'll read about you someday. Um, but really, Waterfall was super tenacious, right? It's, it's still around. It's still around in a lot of places um, because it makes sense to people if they don't think beyond you know, a certain school of thought, if they don't think beyond a simple cause and effect or a simple pipeline. Uh, that's what makes sense to people. And uh, it's taken us a long time to get, to get by. It's like the cockroach of, of big companies. It's very, very difficult to kill. Uh, so also, a little later on from, from Waterfall, we had things like uh, the knock was very prevalent, right? Um, this picture is here because the title was Managed Services, Serious Fun. And it was like not sarcastic at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was just completely, I don't know. I just had to put it in because of, the, because of the caption that came up in Google Images. It was awesome. Um, who here ever worked in a knock? Anybody? Wow, awesome. Okay, cool. Maybe not awesome, but <laughs> awesome that you're still around. Um, uh, I mean that you survived, not that you're old. The Knox, Knox are still around too. Um, so during this time, we see lots of lots of mention to like Moore's law, and uh, you know computing is accelerating at this crazy pace, and things are getting much much quicker, right? Um, so as we get bigger and more complicated systems. Virtualization becomes a big thing because suddenly you've got this big machine and instead of having everything that you want to pile onto it stomp each other to death, you want to sort of compartmentalize it and, and separate it and make sure that there's some safety there. And uh, so you get distributed systems where you want to sort of diversify these virtual machines so that uh, if one of your machines dies, everything doesn't go south. And uh, suddenly it becomes possible to run like a server on your desktop or a server somewhere where it wouldn't conventionally exist. Uh, it'll take a little while for this to happen on the desktop and we'll get there. Um, and following this we had things like version control and make and, and you've got early versions of automation or at least re repeatable scripting that has some kind of flexibility and variance and uh, it was pretty fun to work with. Uh, but this is very, very early. This is like RCS, right? This is not Git that we're used to. This is very early days of version control. Uh, mostly to save people from just renaming files, which we know still happens today. So uh, lots of tenacious old practices going on. And, and we have the very beginnings of sort of tech entrepreneurship and online code because it's now sort of possible to build your own things without a giant uh, organization behind you. And giant organizations are not I idle at this time, like uh, idle and idle. So uh, idle sort of arises as this thing where big companies are seeing like, oh, tech is making everything super complicated for us, and uh, we don't know how to manage it, and we want to lock things down. So let's implement some kind of a framework to make this all standardized and simplify our lives so we can go on vacation and, and trust that everything's going to be great. And so there's like 30 volumes to ITIL, right? The original ITIL was like enormous, and I don't know if anyone's ever read the whole thing. Like, I don't know how it works, but it's very, very command and control IT oriented, right? It's very much like I will come down from the mountaintop with my 30 volumes, and uh, somebody will read them and implement them and make sure that everything stays consistent. And uh, it's a very realistic expectation. Uh, so, ITIL, it you know, in itself is not necessarily bad. Right, but it's probably overkill, and it probably doesn't apply very well to what all of us are doing, or really anybody at all. Um, so naturally, Agile sort of appears, right, to pull us out of uh, this mess that, that we've created in terms of like mass standardization and efforts to lock everything down. And uh, so, so now we're seeing sort of like the the rebellious teenage years of software development arise, right, where it's like screw your corporate ways of doing everything standardized. Like, we're going to just wing it and figure it out, man, because that's more natural, right? So uh, things are starting to get good, but we're way, way off still. And we find ourselves back at manufacturing, too, because lean sort of arises as this way of doing things in an agile manner, but with an absolutely minimal cycle, right? Like, just, just run it as 
tiny as possible and minimize waste. Um, and you, you have things like extreme programming and big business at this time is sort of starting to outsource things, right? So they're like, uh, this is happening in parallel. They're like, we have all this standardization and stuff that we don't have to deal with as long as we tell some company that we hire that they have to be like ITIL certified and compliant. And that way we can have our standardization but not actually have to deal with it ourselves. And this is gonna work out great. So we're just gonna be like, running a business and then getting some other company to implement in everything like according to our, you know, our, our master plan uh, that we've bought from some consultant. And uh, you know, in, in most tech entrepreneurship at this time where you're building software, you're sort of shipping CDs, right? So back at this time, um, and for a long time, we're still shipping CDs or, or disks, floppy disks, five, five and a quarters, three and a halves. Um, and that brings us to sort of the rise of open source, right? Where we start reusing code and sharing it with people because we realize that our code doesn't necessarily entirely drive the value of our uh, organization at all levels, right? There's some stuff that's like super core and we do it better than everyone else and we want to do that stuff, but everything else we'll borrow from someone else and we'll share it with other people because it saves time and make sure that we can hire people that understand a little bit more than just our specific company. Um, and Jenkins begin, be, begins sort of automating things to a, to a certain degree. And uh, it grows this culture, open source grows this culture of sort of pitching in to make great ideas, actually great things, uh, by being really, really crappy and then just gradually improving, right? And, and uh, so Linus comes along and gives us Git, and we're all like, beginning this phase of like radical collaboration, right? Where everybody is working on the same things at the same time. And it's wonderful and very, very complicated and there's a lot of problems involved. But overall, we're starting to build things together, right? Even as separate members of different companies coming together to work on the same thing and it's kind of amazing. So we have global collaboration on software products and, and there's patches flying around via news groups and all kinds of alternate ways before we had GitHub and all these wonderful things. Um, and now we've hit Moore's Law to the point where like the desktop is very powerful, right? And virtualization is fairly mature. We see things like Mitchell coming out with Vagrant and suddenly you can virtualize an entire environment on your desktop or your laptop as a, as a developer, which is amazing because now you can sort of see your production system locally and work on things and not have to worry about, well, I hope this works or you know it worked for me and you know that sort of happened with the best of intentions back in the day but the effect was oh yeah you're throwing things over the wall and, and uh, everything's gonna break and, and you don't care and you have no empathy for us and uh, but we didn't know that at the time we just thought everybody was dicks and it was just <laughs> like bad all over the place so, um, so we have configuration management and infrastructure as code sort of arising uh, as part of this uh, and it's driven by open source because we've got common libraries that we can all draw from, right? And uh, continuous delivery begins to be a thing uh, because uh, Jez comes out with this book and, and everyone's talking about sort of shipping software now and shipping becomes the focus of everybody's engineering efforts. And with things like Git, you can just sort of check something out from a centralized repo and that can be your deployment technique, right? But uh, before that, you know, maybe you had some kind of a uh, code review process and that simplifies a lot of things, right? You no longer have to ship giant artifacts. You can be a little bit more flexible. And um, Jenkins is now at a, po at a point where you can run a series of tests fairly easily and guarantee that you have a, a certain caliber of quality all the way through to increase your confidence, basically, in delivering software. And uh, here's where we start to see the conflict arise, right? The real conflict between dev and ops. Uh, because we, you inherently have these competing incentives and priorities, right? You have uh, ops wants everything to stay the same forever, and that would be great. If nothing ever changed, they'd be super happy, and everything would be fantastic. And dev wants everything to change all the time, right? Uh, if nothing stayed the same, then they could get so much done 
and they could just be constantly shipping software, right? So these things run into each other fairly, fairly quickly. And we have this thing arise called the wall, right? <laughs> and the wall becomes this subject of conversation for everybody because suddenly you have, you know, and we had this gesture from yesterday where uh, dev is just accelerating at an incredible pace, right? You can just build software like crazy now because you can base it on some open source thing, change a couple things, and then say, yeah, let's, let's ship that out, right? And it runs into ops because ops is like, well, nobody talked to us about this, right? Like, where did this come from? What am I supposed to do with it? It doesn't even have a readme in the repo. So uh, here's where we start to see technical debt, right? Because there's very little visibility back into development about what it takes to run and operate software and, and keep it uh, stable and sustainable at scale, right? Maybe scale wasn't even considered because you're running a single instance of a server on your, your dev laptop, right? And so all of this sort of gives rise to DevOps because all of a sudden we need to address this problem or else we're just going to deal with the wall forever, right? So um, we start to see some results um, from all this infrastructure as code, people doing it well people doing collaboration well, doing the bridge between dev and ops well. Um, when things like Heartbleed come up, they're suddenly, they're like, oh yeah, Heartbleed came up and we patched it and all of our systems were updated in about five minutes. And everybody else is like, this is gonna be a month. Like, I'm not going home for a month because I have to go and log into all my servers and check them and then go and upgrade software and make sure that nothing broke and run all this manual regression testing because, you know, we had incurred this technical debt over all these years where we knew that we should be au automating all this stuff, but we just couldn't afford it or we couldn't arrive at a consensus that it was important enough to spend time on before something catastrophic happened. And uh, we're starting to see more insourcing, right? We're starting to see these companies that were outsourcing forever start bringing things back in-house because they realize that business value really actually matters to the point where you want people close to your individual company mission working on the core pieces of your business. You know, the stuff that drives value, the stuff that makes you money should probably be handled by people who are 100% aligned with your goals and not trying to make money off of you. Um, and that makes a lot of sense, right? So we're seeing people abandon outsourcing at this point and uh, there's been this giant shift. And as you do that, you start thinking a lot about your software delivery process and your testing process and how you build code because maybe you've never done it before and this is a giant piece of technical debt that you now have to address and build out all this tooling um, so I think that a, a large portion of this focus on DevOps is, is because of this issue that people need to start building their own things and nobody's been good at it if you haven't been doing it for ages. And uh, it's going to take a lot of effort. But luckily we have things like DevOps days where people can share stories of that where, you know, I'm coming from an outsourcing situation and we're starting to build things in-house and how do you do it, how was it done? There's not a lot of shared stories out there. People don't really write articles about this stuff because they're usually buried in work, right? They're usually, they're embarrassed about their situation. Uh, they don't want to talk publicly about it until it's like fixed and they can say, here's how we did it. Um, so open spaces is, is an opportunity for doing things like that and coming to conferences like uh, DevOps Days and DevOps Enterprise. So now we're at the point where we, we all accept that empathy makes everything better and, and everything's fantastic when we share, right? And we talk about this for good reason. We have blameless postmortems and, and retrospectives and we talk about resiliency at scale and things are getting a little bit more advanced, right? But where do we go from this point, right? Um, so beyond DevOps, like what are we working on next? And, and it's been sort of said by previous presentations, I think we're all sort of on the same page with this. Um, automation is, is the next piece that we need to tackle and, uh, and focus on. And uh, 
you know, it, it takes a lot of attention and care to make sure that you're not just building like errors as a service, right? You want to make sure that your automation actually does something valuable over and over again in a repeatable and consistent way. Um, chat ops is another big part of that, right? Um, I don't think anyone's ever used this uh, stupid word before, because <laughs> when I typed it into Google, nothing came up, and it said, do you mean collabo tomato, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> I was very happy about that. Um, and when we start talking about things like Conway's Law, like, which is basically people designing systems that mirror their communication structures and their organizations, right? And chat ops is a, a big part of that. Chat itself is a big part of sort of shaping the communication of a company and thus shaping what you do, which is largely building software these days. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip right past this slide because really I, I don't have time to talk about containers. <laughs> So I, I want to leave you guys with a little bit of advice, um, which is very opinionated, but uh, that's okay. You can discount my opinions. Um, I would say um, hiring for DevOps right now is, is very challenging, and I would advise against it entirely. Uh, it's very much driven by number two, the, the whole fashion side of the meaning of trend. And uh, it's very expensive. And they might have a technical skill or two, but it's really difficult to say what they do exactly and what they're really good at. And it's hard to sort of match that up with what you need, right? So um, try and be specific. Um, and that's my next point. Be specific about what you need when you talk about DevOps. You know, Be specific about what you're looking for and what the specific problem that you're trying to address is because, you know, just like everybody's been saying, when you're trying to communicate with people, you have to make sure that you're clear or else you're going to be dealing with a lot of assumptions and people uh, coming to their own conclusions about what you say and what you mean. And that's really complicated. Uh, another thing is like when you're sort of working towards your goal, right? don't really call it DevOps if you can avoid it. right? Talk about what you're specifically trying to achieve. right? We want to make sure that software breaks less in production. Or we want to actually run our continuous integration scheme uh, in half the time, right? Or it has to be under 20 minutes. Or we want to be able to onboard our developers in no more than 20 minutes, right? And, and spin up a dev laptop. Or we want to be able to release a new version of software in less than an hour. Um, or even, you know, we want to ship software in, in less than four weeks. It doesn't have to be something super, uh, super optimistic, like just better than what you have right now, but be specific about what better looks like. And that's going to increase your odds of success immeasurably. Uh, as you do all this, don't forget about security. Don't uh, just think about it afterwards or assume that it's sort of, comes around uh, automatically when you automate things, because it absolutely doesn't. Um, there's another great slide that gets used way too much, uh, but I love. Um, and everybody uh, who watches my talks probably knows what it is. But um, So I went with brick. Um, but yeah, plan your access, right? Plan what happens when someone leaves the company. Um, plan for game days. Uh, PagerDuty does this great like Failure Fridays thing where They'll bring down part of the system just to see what happens. Um, think about that stuff. You might not be able to do it right now, but think about it and think about it when you're building something new because you want to be you want to aim for being able to do that. Um, one one of the last things I want to leave you with is is that tech is probably not your problem. Um, I, I use this image because Monopoly is a, it's a fine game. It's an okay game. It's a people problem with Monopoly, right? Like, nobody likes playing Monopoly because of people. It's not because the game is somehow inherently flawed to a degree that it doesn't work. But eventually, somebody flips the table. Um, and it's because, you know, people have different priorities. People will act selfishly. Um, and that's usually the problem that you have to deal with before you think about, you know, is our stack good enough? Or, you know, should we be using a different uh, key value store, right? Um, all that stuff is kind of a minor problem when you think of the larger cultural implications of running a company and a team. Um, and, and be sure to have a mission, right? 
be sure to sort of aim for something specific and plan an approach. And don't just say, you know, we're going to be more DevOpsy uh, or we're going to be more of one thing or another. Aim for something specific. Um, and you'll find that you have a much easier time getting consensus, agreement, selling it to other people. You'll be able to have better conversations about it, and you'll ultimately end up with a better result uh, when you be specific. And uh, that's it for me. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>